Grace Grace and peace. I'd like to know who of you weren't able to be with us yesterday. Many of you. It seems that we have had a shift of audience. Well, you will be able to access what we touched on yesterday through our YouTube video. But I have to say that we spoke about a paradigm shift and we build in our minds concepts and prejudices that hinder us from receiving the new wine from God and maybe because of our religiosity our prior experiences of having everyone walking in the same pace, in the same way, it's either this way or that way. And God always surprises us with novelty. He is endless, He's infinite, and He has that measure for us beyond that which we might think or desire. So I'd like to start with a prayer in which you will surrender your mind so that He might be able to minister that which is new for you. You will renounce any and every concept or prejudice or preconcept regarding the ministry and the mystery of the kingdom of God. And unfortunately, not everyone will access that because not everyone is open for that. Remember when Jesus spoke about parables, he was asked, why do you speak through parables? He said, it's not unto all to know the mystery of the kingdom of heavens. So the parables were spiritual keys. So a key is a small object that opens a door that allows your entrance into a space, beautiful, ample. But the key is very small. And when you look at the key, you have no idea what that key opens up for the holder. And that's what happens with the Word of God. We have spiritual keys. There are mysteries in the kingdom of God that He wants to reveal to His people. So with that, I'd like to bring to your memory a verse. Those of you who were yesterday will hear again. And those of you for the first time here will know that in Hebrews chapter 5, I spoke from verse 7. But specifically, I made reference to that what is written in the following chapter. Those of you who are drinking milk are as children, but solid food is for adults, for those who by practice, by practice, has their faculties exercised to discern not only that which is good, but also that which is evil. Solid food is for the mature, for the spiritually mature. The children are not here anymore because they have no means of understanding and receiving what you will receive. They still need milk. And when the Bible says that he who feeds in milk, he's talking about simple things. So if you drink milk, you are nourished as a child. But solid food, real food, hearty food is for the adults, is for those who by practice and not by theory have their faculties exercised in order to discern not only good but also evil. So what are these faculties? Intellectual? No, I cannot discern good from evil with my intellectual faculties. Is it physical? Is it muscular faculties? No, I'm talking about spiritual faculties. Solid food is for the adults, for those who are spiritually mature, who, by practice, develop spiritual discernment in order to discern not only good, but also that which is evil. Not only that which is good, but also that which is evil. So, to discern light from darkness, to discern that which comes from the Lord and that which comes, but comes from darkness. There are two kingdoms. There is a duality 
We have the empire of darkness and the kingdom of light. The empire of darkness and the kingdom of light. Jesus says that the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. This is the fruit of darkness. But I have come so that you might have life in its fullness. If the fruit that I see as death, thievery, and destruction, who yields such a fruit? Those who steal, kill, and destroy. But if the fruit I see is life and life in its fullness, who is yielding that fruit? Jesus, he who governs in light. So when the Bible says that the solid food is for the adults, those who by practice have their faculties developed or exercised to discern not only that which is evil, but also that which is good, he is incentivizing us to develop our spiritual faculties. Keep on growing. Keep on moving. I need to grow in this knowledge of light and darkness. And why do I need to grow in this knowledge of darkness? Well, some people say that, well, I only need to grow in the knowledge of light to the point of hearing that, well, I only need to know Jesus. I don't need to know of anything else. But the Bible tells us to get ready for a battle. So when you go to Ephesians, you see a manual of war. You will see in Ephesians, in the beginning, you say, Blessed be the God, our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who before the foundation of the world has blessed us with all sorts of spiritual blessings in the heavenly regions, in the heavenly realms. What are those? Spiritual environments. So, blessed be our God and Father who is in the heavenly realms, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. So, the heavenly realms are an excellent place because that's where God the Father is. But the Word says that there is even better company because the Son who has resurrected from among the dead has taken a seat at the right hand of the Lord above all powers to be named. When he resurrects from among the dead, he says that all authority has been given to me in the heavens and on earth. All authority. He is above every other authority, power, name. So this is an excellent place. The Father is there, the Son is there, and it's the place where the Holy Spirit also is. The Word says that the Spirit scrutinizes our heart and scrutinizes the heart of the Father, bringing revelation, and from here He brings prayer to the Father, teaches us to pray. He prays for us with undiscernible moans. He is the right hand of the Lord. The Spirit is making this bridge. He is God with us. He is here. He is there because there's no distance in the spiritual world. The physics, the law of physics, time, distance, do not apply in the spiritual world. So this is an excellent place. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, spiritual realm, but in the very same letter to the Ephesians, we read that there are more heavenly beings in the heavenly realms. We see that there are kingdoms, principalities, and it's through the church where the multifaceted knowledge of God will be revealed. And when he says now, we read, now is any time. Anytime you will know about principalities and powers in the heavenly realms. So, in the heavenly realms, we have the angels, both of light and dark. That is why the book of Ephesians says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers, dominators of this dark age and place. Where? In the heavenly realms, in the spiritual realms. So this is a place of battle also. Now, Pastor, are the demons in the spiritual realm just as angels? Yes, because demons are angels. Their origin is they are creatures made by God 
originally devised to be of light. They have rebelled because they wanted to live independently from God, and now they became angels of darkness. The fact that was we know as Satan used to be Lucifer, the anointed cherub. A demon is an angel out of its position. An angel that chose to become an angel of darkness. It used to be a light, now of darkness, and where are they? In the spiritual realm. Same place. It's as if it were a soldier trained, or trained to become a special ops, a SWAT team, SEALs, and now he becomes a special ops of darkness. Same person. This person. Now this creature is only out of its original position. And when the Bible says that the solid food is for the adults, those who by practice have their spiritual faculties exercised, not only to discern that which is good from that which is evil. Now, take a look on what's happening in your surroundings. Open your eyes. It's because you don't see it with your biological eyes, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's as real as anything else. This is what we need to learn. We need to break paradigms. We have learned that we don't need to do anything else. It's all done. It's completely finished. Well, he exposed Satan to this embarrassment, and it's fully finished. It's a sentence. It's a condemnation issued at the cross. Satan has been condemned. Now, the sentence is enforced by the church. The church enforces this sentence of the cross. Because this spiritual being of darkness, of evil, that was an angel of light and became a demon, he didn't leave God's presence without a war. There was a battle in the heavens. And when you see Revelations chapter 12, you see that there was a battle in the heavens. There was battle. Michael and his angels have fought. They were expelled. This is a rebellious angel. So this angel had to leave with battle. And why so? Because he didn't just leave. There was a command needed to be issued by God. But did God struggle? Did he fight against Satan? No. Angels expelled angels. Creatures battled against creatures. And when this angel was expelled to the earth, we read that at the desert, after Jesus had been baptized and having been anointed with the Holy Spirit. When the authority comes back from heaven unto earth, and come back, well, that authority existed in Eden. Mankind had authority to command the exit of Satan. When God said, care for the garden, why do you care for your car, your money, your jewels? Because there are thieves. When the man received that command, care for the garden, it's because this spiritual being of evil had been already uh, been expelled and was hovering, surrounding as a lion seeking someone to swallow. But the man received authority to command Satan to leave. And then, you know the story. The woman is accused because she led the man to sin. Well, yes, it's true. There were two voices only at the Eden, God's voice and the woman's voice, at least in Adam's ear. So she led Adam to disobey. She influenced Adam towards evil. However, I always bring this basic question. Where was Adam? What was he doing when the devil entered the garden that he was supposed to take care of? Anyone? Where was Adam? What was he doing? When, well, the woman was talking to the devil, that, and he was supposed to take care of the garden. What was he doing? And then she comes and tells him, I ate of the fruit. I disobeyed. Now, come on, you have to disobey too. 
Where was he that he didn't say, repent now, on to your knees, let's ask for forgiveness, let's go back to the right place. He said, no, well, why not? Give me, give me some of that. He rejected spiritual authority. And that moment, God extracted spiritual authority from the earth. And that is why you don't see in the First Testament not a single instance of a man having authority against the empire of darkness. You will read verses where God says, I will rebuke the devourer. He would say that the prophet says, the Lord who chose Jerusalem rebuke you. Or when Saul is possessed, there's a young lad called David, a worshiper, and the worshiper draws the Spirit of God. And God is seeking for worshipers. It's not the instrument, it's not the speaker, it's not the power of the equipment, but it's the heart of the worshiper that draws the Holy Spirit of God. Now, let me open here. Do you know why the worshiper draws this Holy Spirit of God? Because the sole offer we have to give him back is worship. Everything else he gave us first. When you come and you surrender your life to Jesus, who gave you this life? Do you, are you able to give life to yourself? Was it your mom? Was it a, a sexual intercourse between man and woman? No, it was the Holy Spirit who brought life into your mother's womb. He chose the time and the date. And many times we surrender our children to the Lord. He says, I will surrender to you. Well, do you give it on yourself? Are you able to generate a life, a soul, or a spirit? There's no one able to create ears, noses, foot. God is the only creator. David says in Psalm 139, you were weaving my bones in the womb of my mother and you knew all of my days. So when we bring and surrender our children unto God, we're just giving them back, just like Anna did. Hannah did that. And we bring the tithings and offerings just as we did. We open our wallet, pick up a few bills, our hearts full of pride, and with a countenance as of someone who is doing very special. Let me tell you, at this moment you're just like a child who picks up the wallet of your father to purchase a necktie to give to your father. It's your father who gave himself this necktie. It's the same thing. So there's nothing we give him that he hasn't given us before. And the only thing we give him that we haven't received before is worship. This is the clearest, the purest, most genuine offering that we can give. And that is why he's seeking for worshipers who worship him in spirit and truth. And as we go back to the first testament, that instance where soul is possessed, David comes, plays the instrument, the, demons, the demon has to leave, but he doesn't have authority to command the expulsion. The authority comes back to the land at the Jordan when the Son was embodied and when the Spirit manifests itself visibly and the voice of the Father is heard where you hear, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. At this moment, the Trinity reunites here on land and when it, that happens, something supernatural takes place on earth and the authority is back on earth. And that's, that is why only after that moment that the Trinity reunites at the Jordan, Jesus was then led to the desert, to the wilderness, to be tempted. Notice that the authority was extracted because a man was tempted and succumbed. And the authority came back because a man was tempted and did not succumb to the temptation. And the authority then comes back to the earth. And such authority has come back 
to be used, to be exercised, to be delegated. Jesus says that all authority has been given to me in the heavens and earth, and we resurrects from the dead. He delegates that to the 12, to the 70, to all of those believers. You will see the Semedi coming back full of joy after having gone from city to city, from village to village, saying, In your name, Jesus, the demons submit to us. And then Jesus says, Well, I've seen Satan falling from heaven like lightning. He's talking about the expelling of Satan from heaven. And then he says, And I have given you authority. I have given you that was in the past, so that you might step over serpents, scorpions, and all the power of the enemy. All the power of the enemy. And Jesus says, what? I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Who is saying that the enemy is powerful? Who says that? Jesus. So if you heard any preaching that Satan doesn't have any power, that's wrong. If you heard any preaching saying that he is powerless, that's wrong because he's an angel. Angels are powerful. Now, this is a power used for darkness. And now Jesus gives unto the church all power. He has a bit, and the church has all of it. That is why the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I have never seen Jesus lose a battle. And I've been working on this for many years. They, well, I've been saying that it's been 30 years. I've been working with deliverance 30 years, 30 years. And I met this pastor who was a pastor for 27 years. And I've lost the, my tally because it's a lot more than 30. If it were uh, a game, a soccer game, this would be at the end of the second half. But there's a still a lot more to be done, a lot more to be taught on earth. And, okay, so why did I bring all of this preamble? Well, there is authority to battle against darkness, and that was de delegated by God to the church. And I believe that God thought as follows. Okay, an angel was expelled because he disobeyed. Now this angel arrives on earth and causes mankind to be expelled from God's presence. Now, this mankind is now redeemed and has the authority to expel he who was responsible for mankind's expulsion. It's as if God had pleasure giving mankind the right to enforce the devil's expulsion. Yesterday, I said that many people are suffering, undergoing a number of challenges, hardships that are caused in darkness, and they attribute that to God. Now, specifically, I'd like to talk about the shedding of blood. Yesterday, I shared the story of my husband's family, all firstborn males dead prematurely. Now, what happens when there is bloodletting? Let me read a text in the Bible. This text talks about civil construction. Or at least it seems so. Is it possible to put this verse on the screen? Beautiful. Deuteronomy 22, verse 8. You don't need to look for it because the faith does not come from your pursuit but from hearing. So let's hear this. Actually, I advise you to read your Bible in your meditation and read and listen to your voice out loud. I record my own voice and I listen to it because faith comes from hearing. Have you lived out a situation in which you hear a song and then you keep on humming that song that you heard that once that one time. If you had read that the lyrics for those songs, you wouldn't be singing and humming that along throughout the day. So it's written. When you build a new house, 
you shall make a parapet for your roof. Otherwise, you might have blood guilt on your house if anyone should fall from it. In my version, it reads, when you build a new house, you will have to build a parapet on the roof so that in that you will not place guilt over blood if anyone falls from it. So when you build a house, you shall make a parapet on your roof so that you might not bring over it the guilt for the blood if anyone perchance might fall from it. Now, build a roof. Let's say this is a roof. And God says, build a protection so that you might avoid a tragedy, so that you can avoid anyone falling, and then blood will stain that house if this person falls. He's talking about iron, bricks, cement. Is it possible for a house to become haunted? The Bible says so, so that you may not place on it the guilt for blood. Now, the concept of a house is there, but God also extends that, the house, unto the family. God says that if you believe, you and your house will be saved. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord my family and I. A house is built over the rock. Wind blows, the storm rages, and it won't fall. It's about the family. So, if a building is object of bloodletting, and this blood stains that house, can you imagine blood being let, being shed, over a family. Maybe you, you have not realized that when Pastor Anderson came to receive the offerings and tithings, that Isaac would be blessed by the love of Abram. And what is that? Someone being blessed because of one's father? Generational blessings. We will receive generational blessings, but not the punishments. I will visit the iniquity of ancestors unto the third and fourth generations. I will curse or I will visit the iniquity in up to four generations. Now, why so? Four. Because four are easy to be mapped. I was alive, my mom also, my daughter, and now my granddaughter. I spent some time with my grandmother and with a bit with my great-grandfather, great-grandmother, I'm sorry. So it's not that hard to hear the story of four generations. And when he talks about blessings, he extends that to a thousand generations. His hand gets heavy to punish four, but it is blessing a thousand generations. Are you able to understand God is using a punishment to curse and another to bless and to bless a lot more. So when he told Isaac, I will bless you because of the love I feel and have for your father. I promised him. Yesterday I told you what's in Psalm 37. I have not seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. God is a God of descendants. He visits the iniquity of the parents over the children. The house, the family are subject to the spiritual consequences. And today I'll speak specifically on the blood sins. David killed Uriah to stay with Bathsheba. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 12. So when David thought that God was already overlooking his bad behavior. Nathan, the prophet, comes to his room and confronts him. Nathan says, you have killed Uriah with the sword of the children of the Ammonites. 
the Israelites were battling the Ammonites. But David articulated the forsaken of Uriah in the battleground and kills Uriah for his own favor. So manipulation was one of David's sins. He adultered, he lied, he shed blood, dishonored his leaders. One of his counselors was Bathsheba's father. He dishonored his subjects. And then God shows his adultery and murder. David was a man according to God's own heart. And you will see the generations coming after David they paid a hard and heavy price for what David had committed. The forefathers in the First Testament, just as Jacob did at the end of his life, he called his children to say a blessing. And the children would come to snuggle with their father to heat his body up at the time of his passing. But David, when he died, he was alone. His family was fully destroyed. They needed to call a maiden from Israel to lie down with him because David did not resist that illicit sex. Solomon starts super well his career starts building a temple unto the Lord and as he progresses in time he advances in promiscuity repeating the father's sin and the temple that was built to God ends up being a temple for demons Baal, Astaroth, Moloch these are the gods lowercase g, demons per se, served by the women with whom he slept. Tomorrow we'll talk about promiscuity. Well, house is equivalent to family. Bloodletting in your house, that blood will stain that family. That's exactly what happened to my husband's family. I'll tell you some stories. Many, many years ago, I went to teach uh, in Vilhena, a city in Rondônia, north of Brazil. I was getting ready to start my preaching, just right beginning at the beginning of the service, and there was this lady who came. She was anxious, and she started talking to me. I need to talk to you, she said. I really need to. I simply can't service someone before a service. You need to give time, quality time, at least one full hour, at least many times two hours yesterday I spent two hours with a person it's the same as getting to a hospital unbuttoning your shirt and saying okay operation please it won't happen even if the person is very succinct in summarizing one story the, the service needed to be given is at least one hour and she wanted to be heard at the entrance of the church. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And she insisted, she insisted, and she was anxious. And I said, Pastor, would you mind extending a bit the worship service? Because I need to talk to this lady, at least to calm her down. My intention was to keep her and to have her seated at the pews. And then she said, I need to tell you. I want to know what kind of a God does what he's doing with my son. And then she tells me the story. 20-year-old with cancer in the testes, born and raised in the church. Since the very first minutes of life, he's part of Sunday school, abiding by the book. And now, 21, just about to get married, cancer in the testes. He won't, won't be able to leave a generation because he's a single son. And if there's only one child, he's the only child, and he won't have kids, and he won't be able to be a husband unto that lady with whom he's about to get married. He won't be able to meet his marital duties. 
And then this mom comes, what kind of God does that? And then as she spoke in my mind, there was the same word, abortion, abortion. And that's the Holy Spirit who reveals that. The Spirit that reveals what is happening. But when you are with a person, you can't confront this lady, this person. This person needs to confess. It needs to be an internal stimulus. He who conceals shall not prosper, but she who confesses will reach mercy. There's no avail in saying, I know you have aborted. She needs to bring that on her own. She needs to confess. In my mind, abortion was there all the time, running out of time. And I didn't say, well, you committed abortion, did you? But I asked, did you abort? She was enraged, stepped back, reacted very rudely and said, Doctor, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about my son. He was born and raised in the gospel. And I have to tell you, he never had a sexual experience. He made a vow. He's entering his marriage without having had any sexual contact. I'm talking about him, not about myself. And then I asked again. I wouldn't be able to explain everything I did yesterday. But on the third attempt on touching on the subject, she was denying. And I said, okay, let's do the following. I said, go ahead, travel to Porto Velho. You need to... You said that you need to travel because your son will be operated on tomorrow. So why don't you go then? He needs to be there. She said, and I said, okay, why don't you just go ahead, go with your son. I have nothing else to do to help you. And when she understood, I gave up on the subject. She stopped. It sunk in on her and she said, Pastor, I aborted five times before generating this son. But pastor, I converted. I was insane. I didn't take contraceptive pills because I was afraid of gaining weight. So I would rather just go ahead, get pregnant, and then abort. And I said, my sister, you have spilled blood of five generations. Now, let me make you make an parenthesis here. Rebecca was pregnant with twins, Esau and Jacob. And pregnancy of twins is delicate. There's pressure everywhere, spleen, feel sick, nauseated, and Rebecca says, I'm dying. God says, there are two nations in your womb. He's not saying there are two boys there. There are two lads. He doesn't say Esau and Jacob. He says, there are two nations in your womb. And what if uh, Rivka, Rebecca, had aborted? All Israel would be gone. Those sci scientists that come from that nation, politicians, leaders, all of them, would have died. Because when someone spills the blood of a baby, it's not just of that baby, it's of that baby's children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-great-grandchildren. And if my grandmother had aborted, my mom wouldn't have been born, neither her sisters, I wouldn't be here, neither my brother, my two children, my nephews and nieces, my six grandchildren, none of them would have been born. I have one of them just got married. I will become a great grandmother. Gabriela, Gabriela, can you hear this? I want great grandchildren, okay? But the woman thinks she is aborting a clot of blood. It is not. It's a being made by God. Can you remember what I mentioned yesterday when God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, before I formed you, I knew you, and before leaving the womb of your mother, I have constituted you a prophet unto nations. Before leaving your mom's womb, I have a destiny for you, and your prophetic ministry was already there. Remember the story of Samson in Judge, 
Judges chapter 3, Samson was born to be a deliverer. Mom was barren. Angel shows up and says, you will conceive. He will give you a child and Israel will be delivered by him. You are not here by chance. You are not an outcome of sexual intercourse between man and woman. You come from the heavens. That's where you come from and that's where you are going to. The Bible says that when a man dies, the body goes back to the dust and the spirit goes back to the Lord who has given him. I am 68, I mentioned. This body is more than half of a century walking on the face of the earth. And it will come a time I will go back to the dust and do not look in this pitiful manner and you will also become ash and dust. You will. You can look to your brother and sister and say that. I am an eternal spirit. I'm not bound by time. My flesh has. Eternity dwells in me. And that is why we need to make a choice to walk with God. Otherwise, we will live eternally separated from God. We are made to live eternally with Him. The body goes back to dust and we will go back to Him. Wrong choices will make us become separated from Him eternally. And eternity is a lot of time. Trillions and zillions of years. Now, when you kill a child in your womb, you are killing generations. And then we came to be convinced by an evil media stating that there's no problem at all if you abort. We have representatives in the House of Congress voting and posing abortion as something normal. And I have to tell you something. Please know who you are electing, who you are depositing your ballot for. Because your decision can make this land be marked by darkness or light. There's this evil man proposing a bylaw allowing abortion in any given stage of the pregnancy up till the ninth month. There will be a voting coming soon. So do you know what's happening? If abortion is deemed legal in Brazil, and offered by the public health service until the ninth month, and this is what is being proposed, you know what's going to happen? Every physician in the public health system in Brazil, all the assistants, the paramedics, nurses, will have their hands stained with blood by a spirit of death. Do you know what else? All of Brazil will finance death because who finances the public system is you, it's me. So we need to be up to date with what happens in the government. The church needs to be present. The church is not secular and holy. The church is holy everywhere, anywhere, be it the business, in the courts. I have a son of mine who hears me. He's a, a holy man. He is a judge. His name is Tiago. In, in Portuguese, it's James. And he is in, in, a, in a paternal leave because he just had a kid. But when he goes back, he knows that this court where he services, that's a holy place. It's a holy ground. And he needs to see that as such. So when God sees the church, God sees us different from what we see ourselves. God sees us as a church everywhere. God has a cosmo vision of the church. This is a place of celebration. But the church is a church everywhere, at the market, at the grocery shop, at the bank. You are church as you go to the restroom. And the Holy Spirit is with you. 
all the time. Our behavior, our praxis, our walk can change this nation. Now, back to abortion. Let's say I call a mom with a little baby. And let's say the baby is one year old. Everyone looks at the baby, so chubby. It's a girl wearing laces, beauty. Everyone thinks it's a beauty. One month old, baby is brought to be consecrated. Everyone thinks that's very trendy and beautiful. Now, question, where was this baby nine months ago? Where was it? In the mother's womb. One month pregnant. If mom had aborted, it wouldn't have been a clot of blood. It would have been this child everyone thinks is a cutie. Now, we weren't able to see what we see today, but since that moment it was formed and placed there in the mother's womb, it was the same child. So abortion would mean that this beautiful chubby baby would have been killed. Now, Pastor, I have no history in abortion in my life. I myself did not get involved. Now, I remember that there was this colleague from work. She wanted to abort, but I was feeling pity for her, so I drove her there, and I thought that if she went there by herself, she would maybe have uh, uh, hemorrhage. So I drove her to this abortion clinic, despite not agreeing with that. Now, let's say that it was this little baby we saw here in front being consecrated and it's this mom and this mom says you know what I don't want this baby anymore yeah, it's, it's too loud it cries too, too loud it's just a nuisance I want to kill it would you drive me to, to get this baby killed but pastor it's not the same thing that's not the same thing but it is we just couldn't see it then and we can see it now no pastor I didn't drive anyone to the clinic but there was this lady who was in a very difficult time and she didn't have the money to pay for the abortion. She really wanted to do that and I was really pitying her and I lent her money. Oh, really? Now, let's say the very same woman who wants to kill this one-month-old baby and she says, hey, I want to kill this baby. It's just a nuisance. I found this... Uh, professional killer who is willing to kill my baby for such and such amount of money. Now, if you give me the money, I'll get the professional to be done. Otherwise, I'll just get a hammer and smash her head. No, wait. No, let's be humane here. I'm going to give her money to get the baby killed humanely, let's say. Pastor, that's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Come on. But it is. Now, Pastor, another situation. I heard this story. It was my sister talking to my mom. I was just eavesdropping. That was a very delicate conversation. I heard that story, and I didn't take a stand. I didn't speak out. Do I have a responsibility? You do. Because if you are around, you hear that story, and you do nothing about that to convince that person not to do it, your silence is a mission. So spiritually, if you do not take a stand against it, you are for it. What about the man? Are there spiritual consequences for the man? Oh, yes. If there was money given, if there is no stand taken, if you have not insisted the mom to go ahead with the pregnancy. But then, for the man, there's an additional consequence. Psalm 78, that talks about people of God leaving Egypt. And it speaks that the death of the firstborn in Egypt meant that God struck the first fruits of the virility of those people. So, firstborn are called firstfruits of one's virility. 
First fruits of one's virility. This is the first fruit of the virility of a man. Now, when Jacob called his 12 children to bless them, he calls Reuben the first fruit of his virility. The first fruit of the virility of the camp of Dan. And when Reuben is called, Psalm 78, verse 51. Would you mind casting this verse? Todo primogênito no Egito. So, he struck all the firstborn in Egypt, the first issue of their strength in the tents of Ham. The firstborn or the first issue, the first fruits of their strength. It's the first fruit. When Jacob calls his 12 children, he says, Reuben, you are the first fruits, the first issue of my strength, of my virility. Usually abortions are the first children in uh, illicit dating relationship. They are too young to take on the marriage responsibilities. Well, let's, let's resolve this with an abortion. Who will know? It will be okay. We will just continue on. And they end up surrendering the first fruits of virility unto death. And they are agreeing with that. So what is the spiritual consequences of an abortion? Abortion is the spilling of innocent blood. Where? Inside the body of a woman. What are the spiritual consequences? Diseases, severe illnesses such as uterus cancer, ovary cancer, disease in their, the mother's body, and also the impossibility to keep on going in one's life. A dating relationship doesn't end up in marriage. A business doesn't end up in success. You cannot enter uh, specific professional desires. Everything is aborted. And what about for men? Same thing. And there's also an, an added implication. If this is the firstborn, if the man agrees to surrender the firstborn unto death, there is a consequence of surrender, the first fruit of his virility unto death, which is his virility goes down the drain. And he will soon need a little blue pill because he will lose his virility. He gave out his virility under darkness. Now, the consequences are generational in nature. Maybe I can avoid having the illness in my own body, but maybe in my son's body, my children's body, great-grandchildren's body. Now, back to the lady. She said, Pastor, I aborted five times. She spilled the blood of five generations. And after having spilled the blood of these five generations, she had this child, the only one she wanted to raise because she was a bit more mature. She was now a newborn woman, but the sin was concealed. It had not yet been confessed. So she really had a hard time confessing. And then I said, you generated that life in the tomb of five siblings. The place where you spilled the blood of five of his siblings. Five generations. And you born you bore that child in this environment. There's a spirit of death. I told her that story I shared with you. I said, God is not unfair. God is very fair, even with the devil. And there's a legal rightfulness for the spiritual punishment to come over him. There was an open door in order to have that death caused. But I have repented, pa Pastor. I believe, I believe. If you have repented and confessed, of course. But your repentance defined your eternity. 
the soul that repents from the sin will be forgiven. But you were concealing that. You had never been. You had never told that before. The church has the power, the authority to bind and unbind, and the church can pray with you. And if there's an agreement here, there's agreement in heaven. Let's pray now for God's mercy over your son's life. You have just taken away from the hands of the devil that right he had. Now, church, God doesn't play being God, and neither does the devil. Anything he has in his hands from our lives, he will use against us, be it in our generation or in future generations. So we went along and prayed. And if you visit my older videos on YouTube, you'll see that I say, I usually say, well, I don't know how that story ended, and that's very common. But then I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Pastora Tânia Teresa Oficial, and then there are other new videos where I tell the end of that story. Well, the denouement was that I was teaching a class in Curitiba, a deliverance seminar. 150 people were present, amongst them pastors, leaders. That lady was there, and I was aware of that. So I started telling that very story of her son who had cancer in the testes. And I said, you know what was the intention of hell to kill all future generations? She killed five generations, and I'll, I'll do the rest. I'll kill the rest. If this young man wasn't able to have a child, that family was interrupted. And as I was telling that story, this woman came on walking through the aisle, came to my side. And I thought it was someone who worked at that YWAM based and was there right next to me. And I was speaking and I stopped speaking, looked at her and she said, do you recognize me, Pastor? No, I don't. I am that woman you are talking about. And I came here to tell you the end of the story. Pastor, till that very day, I had never confessed that sin of bloodletting that was concealed. And that day, I confessed. I cried and I understood the spiritual world. And there I went to Porto Velho. On Monday, we went to the physician's clinic. The tumor was invasive and metastasis. And the physician wanted to run another exam prior to the surgery in order to have a better idea of what would be the case. And the doctor was very surprised when he ran a new PET scan. The tumor was decreasing instead of increasing. And she said, well, the doctor said, there's something wrong. This type of tumor never decreases inside, it only grows. And then he postponed the surgery to another two days. I will repeat this exam. The second exam, it was weathered just like an orange. And it was all weathered. It went smaller and smaller. And making long story short, the tumor went completely away. And my son is married. His wife is pregnant. And they will have the first child. And the response was exactly that. Praise be the Lord. And they were all pastors and leaders in that course. And she said, she took the microphone and she said, you pastors, leaders, confess your sins because that which is concealed is destroying your future generations. Oh boy. And then today I'd like to conclude because I want to be rightful with my time allotted today and I invite you to be back tomorrow. But I conclude today telling you that when we talk about spiritual inheritances, we look backwards. We analyze the sins committed by our parents, grandparents, 
great grandparents Tudo bem. and great great grandparents. O que acontece na nossa vida de ação maligna? What happens in our lives? In evil, around 30% comes from these legacies. 70% around that comes because of those sins we have not confessed. Now, our sins, which are concealed, do not afflict our lives in 70%, it leaves a spiritual legacy to future generations. So everything I conceal, everything that is in darkness, in the purview of darkness, is a proxy, signed for Satan to act on our lives in our future generations. This is very clear. To lose a child due to Cancer in the testes does not extract salvation from his life. But if you have to bury a child because your child had cancer in the testes, that extracts the fullness of life that has been promised to you. The consequences due to sins caused or committed by our ancestors can eliminate the abundance of life of four generations. So we cannot leave anything from our lives in the hands of darkness. So when Moses came to the Pharaoh and said, let my people go, that was a message from God. Let my people go to celebrate in the wilderness. Pharaoh asked, who's going? Everyone, Moses said. Those young, old, children. And then Pharaoh wanted to bargain. Well, leave the animals. Well, Moses answered, not even a nail. Not even a nail will stay in the hands of the devil. Your reputation that might be preserved if you conceal your sin is not as worthy as your deliverance. And the deliverance of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, Please bow your head. Father, in the name of Jesus, the powerful name of your Son, Jesus, here we have another portion of what you have been teaching me and what I have been teaching your people. There it is, Father. Yet another teaching that comes from the highness, from the heavens, to cleanse us. You say in your word that I am the gardener. My father is the farmer. Every branch in me is pruned by my father. We can all be pruned and cleansed. And once cleansed, he says, you are cleansed by the word. And also your word teaches us in Revelations 19, when the bride meets the groom, we read that the supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb is about to come, and the bride made herself ready. The bride makes herself ready and ornates herself, cleans herself, so that she might be granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. Father, we want to live a transparent life before you without having anything in the hands of the enemy. So, Lord, I cannot convince your people of anything, but your spirit can. Lord, that by your Spirit, by your Spirit, that you might fulfill this word in the hearts of your children. And that which I am not able to teach, complete your message, that they might be instructed by your Spirit in order to be full in their lives, in order to be transparent, frank, and be able to confess their sins. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Pastor Anderson, 
Would you give me another five minutes? But you, you wouldn't be able to say no, right? But the Spirit uh, nudges me to tell you a story. A lady who was well-to-do had a kidney, a severe kidney disease. 14 years with kidney failure. This was a godly woman. I knew her. She was, she really lived by the book. You really couldn't understand why she was suffering so badly. But there was a spiritual ingredient there because the woman was there waiting for a kidney transport. And every time, it wouldn't work out. She would either get sick before the surgery or the donor wouldn't be available. 14 years in dialysis. So I came to talk to this lady and 14 years of dialysis, three kidney transplants, frustrated. And I started talking about spiritual legacy. She understood. So she gathered the family around a table, all of her family, and I went to Sao Paulo. So his angel, where I live, is around three and a half hours by car from Sao Paulo. So there she was, all the family around the table, grandmother at the head of the table, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. All of them were Christian. These stories, I witnessed myself. There are pastors in that family. The, the grandmother's children, some of them are pastors. They all heard the material I have about spiritual legacies and spiritual inheritances. So when I got there, I didn't need to explain anything. They had already been exposed to the material. And I asked, did you watch the videos? They said, yes. Okay, so God spoke to me when I saw her in this state and God spoke to me that grandma has the spiritual keys to this disease. Grandma has the spiritual keys to this disease. And when I said that, because God revealed to me that grandma had the spiritual keys to the disease. So I understood that she had the secret. It's the older people who have the secrets of the family. If you go and speak with the older people, they know things you don't. So when I said that grandma had the spiritual keys of the disease, she raised her hand, big, big table, and she raised her hand and said, yes, I indeed, indeed I do. And she started telling her story. And The case is that she was very young, got married, went to live in the countryside, ended up in getting involved with another person. And back then, 70 years ago, feuds were common. So what happened is that her husband killed that boyfriend and buried him in the garden. So called her and said, no, do you know your boyfriend? He's dead, buried here. You have two choices now. You can shut up. No one will know that I killed this man. And no one will know that you were a mistress. And we will be happily ever after. And the other option is you will speak out. I'll go to jail. I'll be released one day. And when that happens, I will kill you and bury you with your little boyfriend. And she remained silent. And they came to know Jesus eventually, got converted, had children, believers, husband died. And this grandma was bawling while speaking about that in front of all the family. And it wasn't a beautiful past. No one accused her. Everyone understood her deep embarrassment. And she said, it's a relief to speak out about this. 
afastei. As cadeiras eram de rodinhas, eu afastei. I e fiquei olhando de longe aquela família, a vovó na ponta da mesa. Away é, e looked that family together, volta. grandma at the center of the attention. And as I observed the family and the Quando dynamics, it came to me that família, when we usually see in our family a holy grandma, we cannot imagine how floozy she could have been. But yeah, it could have happened. She wasn't born with white hair. Se with ela não that angelic face, and if she wasn't born in the gospel, oh, Sabe there are stories to be told. Do you know what Três happened? Depois, Three months later, that chão. woman was with a full Tirou functioning kidneys. The story was história. extracted from darkness. The power from the devil was taken away because it's important to confess. I can only agree in prayer if these people confess. And if you confess, we can unbind that in the spiritual world. And that is why Jesus talks about that, about confession. And in James, confess your sins one to another in order to become healed. Not to have salvation, It's in order to have a fullness, fullness of life. Amen?